Okay. So last thing we spoke about was bodies and stuff like that. And actually, the very last thing we spoke about is the uh, transduction, signal, signal transduction. Uh, now, it, it would be worth mentioning that uh, we skipped through a couple of metabolic stuff that are removed this semester. For those of you who uh, had the last year or last semester know that uh, we have reduced a lot of material you know, and effort to try to uh, get things more and more comprehensible and more, you know, compact. Uh, and so uh, we definitely skipped through the cholesterol uh, metabolism. Uh, and I'm going to mention it briefly, but I don't uh, have much to uh, talk about other than the context of integration metabolism. And so for the, uh, for the uh, single cell reduction, we uh, mentioned that we're going to mention three, uh, talk about three examples, discuss three examples of signal transduction that all follow the same main scheme, which is a signal pass from, from hormone, from uh, uh, any kind of hormone that will bind to the target cell, and that one molecule of hormone will induce some sort of cascade that will amplify throughout the cell that will result in stimulation or an inhibition of some proteins that will eventually manifest itself in some sort of biological Events. Okay, and that would be your physiological response. Uh, we mentioned to do that, they all have a secondary messenger, uh, which is something that is made inside the cell, in the cytosol, uh, and usually it's a small molecule that go ahead and activate other proteins by simply binding. So the whole signal transduction is a series of binding and conformational changes that is tightly controlled by modifications usually that will induce those conformational changes. And most of those modifications that we've been seeing so far are through covalent uh, addition of fossil, again, yeah, fossil, which is which been the theme throughout the semester. You know, we activate and we inactivate proteins through uh, phosphorylation. Then yeah, those are some of the examples that we need to be aware of in the signal cell interaction with our secondary. All right. We talked about the 7TN, and we mentioned that 7TN have seven transmembrane domains. And of course, like every receptor, they have a cytosolic part and a cytoplasmic part, and of course, the inner membrane uh, part. And so, whatever comes from outside the cell has to bind to the uh, cytoplasmic part, and that will induce conformational changes that will somehow be noticed on the cytoplasmic part inside the cell. And that will, of course, cascade events. In the 7TN, we mentioned, uh, in, addition to the, uh, in addition to the protein, uh, the receptor protein, we mentioned two other proteins. One of them is the G protein, uh, with the three subunits, alpha, beta, and gamma, and alpha being the one that is module that can associate and travel around and come back. Uh, and adenylate cyclase, which is a protein that converts ATP to cyclic AMP, which is, in the case of 7TN, our secondary missing. And cyclic AMP, of course, can bind to plethora of proteins, activating them in order to uh, do uh, subsequent and downstream activations. All right. So, in, in uh, particular example, we mentioned the beta adrenergic one, the one that uh, uh, adrenaline attaches to, uh, to the hormone or epinephrine uh, that causes uh, these different kind of uh, uh, changes inside that. And so uh, here we saw what are the events, what are the sequence of events uh, that happens after the epinephrine binds to the 7TN receptor. And what happens here after it binds, it triggers, of course, a 3D conformational changes, weak bonds are broken, weak bonds are formed, and eventually the cytosolic part which has the G protein attached to it will actually notice that and itself will have the conformational changes. And that conformational change will actually allow it to spit out the GDP, the guanosine diphosphate, and instead binds to that guanosine triphosphate. And of course, once that happens, it no longer can bind to the beta gamma. It will simply dissociate, will travel around until it finds the other one that it can bind to, and that, of course, is the adenylate cycle. So, DDD 
form of the G protein, the gene alpha protein, can bind only to the adenylate cyclase. Okay? And when it binds to that adenylate cyclase, it will, too, make or induce conformational changes activating adenylate cyclase. Now, adenylate cyclase is active. What's going to do? It's going to convert ATP to cyclic AMP. And now we have a lot of cyclic AMP. And that AMP will go many proteins, including, including protein kinase A, you know, the one that phosphorylates different proteins. Obviously, since we have protein kinase A, that means we have protein kinase B, C, D, etc. So that's what we call it. Anyway, but in this case, protein kinase A, which finds proteins, the target proteins, and phosphorylates them. Oh, sorry, changes them. And it adds phosphate to them. And that will either activate them or inhibit them. If it binds, for example, to pyruvate kinase, it will inhibit it. We know that from glycolysis. But if it binds, for example, to, say, phosphate kinase 2, it will activate. It will activate the phosphate. So, depends on what binds and the response. But anyway, so that is your cascade. Of course, the next thing is to kill the uh, message what happened now. So, the form of G protein that we just talked about that actually activates adenylate cyclase binds to what? The one that activates adenylate cyclase. So those are the, really the uh, uh, subtleties in uh, this kind of stuff. The one that binds to adenylate cyclase is it all that binds to GDP or is it all that binds to GDP? ATP, something like that. How are you doing? All right. So it's GDP. That's right. If it binds to GDP, it's no longer it's no longer able to bind to the adenine cyclase. It will bind to the opposite. It's true. So the termination happens on different levels, if you remember from our discussion on Friday. Uh, first of all, one of the first things is to stop adenine cyclase from making cyclic AMP. Because as long as we have cyclic AMP, we have activation of protein kinase and other proteins, by the way, that will keep us in point. So we need to stop that messenger, the cyclic AMP messenger, and that's by stopping the adenylate cyclase. But adenylate cyclase will not stop as long as the G alpha protein is bound to it. So G alpha protein should not bind to it. And the only way that it will not bind to it is by getting rid of the GTP. And the only way to get rid of GTP is simply by hydrolyzing that phosphate and make it into GDP. Once it becomes GDP, then it will no longer bind and it will simply go back to its uh, beta gamma and of course the receptor. So now, when that happens, adenylate cyclase is not stimulated, it's inhibited. So we don't have a secondary receptor. So what, what makes the G alpha protein hydrolyze GTP? It is actually GTP hydrolyzed, that's its job. It's, it, it sucks at it because it's very slow. Okay? And that's the idea, we want it to be slow. Because if it immediately does the hydrolysis, it will never bind to the adenine cyclase, it will never have a secondary message. So it has a, so to speak, an internal timer or clock. It binds it and it works very slowly. And in the meantime, while it's trying to get rid of the GTP, it will bind to the adenine cyclase giving the message. But eventually it will act to hydrolyze. Alright. Oh, well, that's a really good G protein hydrolyzed GTP is extremely fast. So we need to think of that kind of stuff and what kind of question that comes within, with, that comes within this, uh, these kind of details, or that level of details at least we need to be aware of. Okay, All right. I think everybody got through. Uh, our friends, but some, some say that true. No, it's extremely slow. It's extremely slow. It does not, if it's fast, again, you will not have a secondary. Beta arresting. Now that is something we talked about also on Friday. Beta arresting binds to what? 
Christ or what? Is that your solid domain of 78? Outer domain, the transfer domain, or does it bind at the next second? Which one does beta rest and bind? Beta rest and as a matter of fact, that's our fourth player in the 17 system. We have three, but we have four, which is beta adjusted. Beta arrested. <laughs> All right, beta arrested, the majority says, binds to the cytosolic domain of 7 p.m. That's true. When it binds to the cytosolic domain of 7 p.m., what does that do? That will inhibit, that will lock it, on a closed kind of uh, on a closed kind of conformation where the hormone cannot bind. All right, basically that's killing the original messenger. So we have many separate organs. But here's the thing about uh, the beta receptor. Okay, uh, first of all, the, the receptor itself doesn't bind all the time, right? It's there's a chemical equilibrium. So once it doesn't bind, that's what is a golden opportunity for a receptor to bind. As a matter of fact, it cannot only bind to the to the cytosolic domain of uh, 70. No, it has to be phosphorylated. So we have a protein called a receptor kinase, and it's a very general protein. It kinase or it kinases receptor. Yeah, it kinases the the cytoplasmic side of that protein, and once it's phosphorylated, then and only then a resting can bind. Arista cannot bind to the cytosolic domain and it bind it to. Otherwise, it will stop that isn't uh, <coughs> So it's when the hormone itself is dissociated, then protein kinase or receptor kinase rather can phosphorylate it and that will allow Arista to bind. Of course, then we will have absolutely no binding of the hormone. That has to be phosphorylated cytosolic domain, not the inner membrane, and of course, definitely not the. Uh, the outer domain, outer, outer uh, domain. Now we're talking about two toxins that actually take advantage of that, the chorotoxin, uh, chorotoxin, and the protosis, and each one is responsible for locking the G protein in a certain configuration, either keeping it all active or keeping it unactive, basically, either allowing the message to be completely uh, transmitted basically killing it and not allowing it to be transmitted. So those are the seven things. Then we talked about the receptors. Those are receptors that are dimeric, and they themselves are kinases. Those have the ability to kinase themselves, to phosphorylate itself. When I say kinase, that's right. Of course, that was in particular the example is an insulin receptor, one that I'm pleased with. And we mentioned in this receptor, that it has two halves that are mirror images of each other. They have to come together in order to allow the hormone insert in this case to bind. Otherwise, it cannot bind to half. And once that binding happens, then those will be actually together for quite some time. And because of that, the beta supplement is a kinase. It's a protein that phosphorylates. Because they are close to each other, they will cross phosphorylate each other. Now, this one will phosphorylate this one, and this one will phosphorylate this one. Okay? And it's the phosphorylation event that will make things noticeable for the rest of the system. Okay? All right. Okay. So that happened, phosphorylation. And then we're going to have the IRS protein, or IRS1, which is the uh, receptor substrate. That is the one that actually binds to the phosphorylated receptor. And once it's bound, then it will be phosphorylated another protein that is called phosphorylated Okay? So, as you remember from Friday, this is a sequential phosphorylation. Each protein phosphorylated will activate the next protein, and activate the next protein, etc., etc. But it has to be a sequential phosphorylation. And those phosphorylation, by the way, most of them happen on which amino acid? Does anybody remember? Tyrosine, that's right, tyrosine. Tyrosine is on that phosphorylated. Okay? So, once this is phosphorylated, this takes notice, okay? It gets phosphorylated, and it generates our secondary messenger. Secondary messenger. And I want you to be very aware of the nature of this secondary messenger, which is a phospholipid. 
And the remember for the bed is basically glycerol to fatty acids and an alcohol. In this case, what is the alcohol in the inositol phosphate? What is the name of the alcohol in this case? Inositol. Inositol. Remember, we didn't need to remember the structure of alcohol, but we have serine, we have ethanol, and inositol is one of them. All right? So that is one of the alcohols, and it's phosphorylated, they get triphosphate, and the PIP3, which is phosphorylated triphosphate, becomes our secondary messenger. Since it's, it's a, a lipid, it's a phospholipid, it will actually maintain its presence within the membrane layer. And that's where it was. This is the secondary messenger here. It's very frenetic. This is the hemocytol, by the way. Hemocytol. This is diphosphate. One, two. See the diphosphate? One, two. Once it becomes phosphorylated with the kinase we just talked about, it goes by RS, then it becomes one, two, three, and hence hip three. One, two, three. Okay? That's the glycerol. That's your glycerol. That's OR. That means there's not all here. I mean, uh, fatty acid, and that's the other fatty acid. Okay? This one now can travel, and it will find its protein. Phosphoryacetyl. This is, of course, the question that I just answered. But it is phosphorylated that contains what? What does it contain again? Phosphoryacetyl. You'll see why I'm, I'm uh, trying to get this information handed again a little bit. So I hope you today. Okay, phosphoryacetyl has what? Has, as far as the drug has, has all of the above. Has all of the above. Right? It has glycerol, two fatty acids, and alcohol. And in the case of glycerol, the alcohol is called inositol. So if I ask you, phosphoserine will have the. All right. So that will activate it. It will find its protein, which is PDK, dependent kinase that will activate it because it's a secondary messenger. That, by itself, it will activate our fourth protein, which is AKT. Okay. But without this triggering effect here, AKT eventually will not be able to activate whatever comes after this, including what we need to metabolize glucose. Because we're talking about insulin here. Insulin, of course, allows the glucose to be cleared from the bloodstream. Because we have a lot of glucose, we need insulin to actually give the message to get the glucose inside the cell. Okay? This is why we have that. Okay? So if that message is killed somewhere, then we're not going to have insulin. If we don't have insulin, we're not be able to do it. Okay. All right? Are we cool so far? Things are uh, asking at any point. Just let me know. Okay. Now we need to kill them. I said here, I'm telling you that GLUT4 is one of them. GLUT4 has, does anybody remember, has high or low AN to glucose? Has uh, High KM means low affinity. Has a low affinity, right? Because it doesn't kick in until glucose overrun has, uh, has a high concentration in the blood. All right? So we need to get it in here. And so GLUT1 and 3 are not enough anymore. GLUT4 comes and try to kill. All right. All right. We need to terminate this. The termination happens by the removal of all those phosphates that we did. All right? So this is phosphorylated, we have to remove the phosphate. If this is phosphorylated, we have to remove, of course, since it's phosphorylated, the tyrosine amino acid, tyrosine phosphatase will be an obvious uh, choice. Uh, since here, HIP3 is phosphorylated from HIP2 to HIP3, then lipid phosphatase will move it back to HIP2, and hence GDK will not be uh, phosphorylated anymore, and the remaining, of course, AKT will be dephosphorylated or phosphatase by a serine. Uh, phosphatase, serine phosphatase. This last protein is phosphorylated as serine. By the way, the three amino acids that are usually phosphorylated in a protein, tyrosine, serine, and threonine. Those are usually the three amino acids. Okay, so now I'll mention a third example. Third example that is slightly more complicated because this one makes two, two secondary messengers. All right? So, as you can see, the system is in place, and it's also modular. So each one has its own different things to be able to do. Okay, so let's talk about this. This one has inositol, the alcohol inositol, and calcium. 
plus it has also another uh, one we'll see in a little bit. It is 70N, just like the other one, and, except it's a little bit more elaborate, and it has a G14, so it's G alpha Q, to distinguish it from the other one. All right, so what is this? This is PIP2. This is the NOC12 diphosphate, and these are, of course, the two uh, fatty acids. And, of course, in this case, the G14 will break this. Actually, not the G14 itself will break this. The lipase will break this. Remember, lipase is a protein or enzyme, it's a plasma enzyme that breaks fatty acids. But lipase will break it and will give us NOC12 by itself, the alcohol, and will give us a diacylglycerol. This is glycerol, glycerol, you know glycerol, right? With two fatty acids. No alcohol. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so those two will behave separately as messengers. Each one will activate something, it will create a different message. It's an amazing system, really. So here is where we're going to start from. We're going to start after that point that the hormone bound to the to the uh, 7 p.m. and activated the deep protein, etc. Now phospholipase C is active, and just like I showed you this previous slide, this is that enocytolic phosphate. The PIP2, enocetol is broken off, flipped off, it's not the whole, so it's soluble in the second then. And the diacylglycerol now is, will remain in the membrane and will go and activate another protein. What is this protein? Protein kinase C, or PKC, as opposed to PKA. This protein phosphorylates other proteins as well, but it phosphorylates them on a different amino acid. Hence, it activates, it has its own policy of protein that it activates. It, it phosphorylate, which amino acid in this case? You don't know? It's serine, serine and freon. Again, okay? serine and freon. Now, go back. Now, here's what happened. So the, the diacylglycerol, that's a, the fatty acid basically, triglycerol, except it's bad, not right, binds here, activating this. The, the enocytol itself will actually go through the cytoplasm and go to the Another one, another protein that is on the plasmic reticulum. And it binds to there activating it. It's actually a receptor slash channel that will allow calcium to flood the cytoplasm from the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, without going through details that we really don't need to know for the purpose of this step, this will eventually trigger muscle contraction. Calcium will be in the cytoplasm, will flood the cytoplasm, will make a contraction. All right, so but basically we have here several things happen. We have diacide disorder, we have the inositol, and then we have calcium going out because of that. Okay? So it's really elaborate message. And protein kinase C, of course, will go in its own way, and it will activate its own proteins that will allow different metabolic events to happen. Okay? Different metabolic events. But you see how this is important? And you see how really any mistake in all, at least those three that we talked about, can screw things up just because of this phosphorylation? or miscommunication. Okay. The main thing we are, we are multicellular organisms. Each tissue has to receive the right message at the right time to, to respond. All right, any questions about this? Okay, so those are the three yes, ma'am. Uh, PDK? No, actually, that will allow it to activate it more. No, this is what happens first, and then calcium will flood. Uh, so if that enocytol is not broken from the pit, it will not activate the channel. And this calcium will stay inside the endoplasmic reticulum. So this has to happen first, and some calcium will start pumping up. And this, this is that. That's right, that's right. But the initial thing you have to allow the gate to open in the first place. And it will not open without the enocytol. Very good. All right. Okay. So here's my quick question for you. What do you think is there for sporulates? Which amino acid? That's what you can use. A, not C. A. Okay. This would be kind of C here. But I just want to tie things together, so I'm mentioning it would be A as well. All right. Wow. Okay, well, that's the entire scene. 
the Pharisee. Okay, Pharisee. The big hands in the Pharisee. Ah, the Pharisee. This one is Syrian and Trinity. Okay, C is Trinity. All right. So again, briefly, what happens here is you know she told this clip off that uh, first four years ago. And that by itself will go and bind to the calcium channel and then it doesn't really good, allowing the calcium to flood the cytoplasm, while that side of the turtle will go and activate protein kinase C that will activate other proteins, not just like protein kinase A. Okay, by the way, this is what, what happens here with the calcium ion and the cytoplasm. It does many things, including glycogen breakdown. Actually, we break down glycogen, we flood it with more glucose. Right? This is what happens in the opposite direction of that too. Okay. All right. So now, now it's time to review all what we talked about this semester. This is called metabolic integration or metabolism integration, and that happened in chapter 27 for, for, uh, for in the book. And here we are going to, again, try three scenarios. One of them is uh, for obesity. The other one is uh, diabetes, and we're going to talk about also alcoholism. And of course, we're talking about those events here, those, those quote unquote lifestyles to some extent, uh, in, in the context of metabolism. Just see what happens metabolically speaking. And, and really, the idea here to review, and of course, to increase our knowledge and all that kind of stuff, but also to review what we're talking about. Okay, let's review carbohydrates, carbohydrates in the liver. What happens to it after it goes, gets in? It becomes, of course, glucose 6-phosphate, right? Now, in the liver, which is a liver, by the way, what happens is, if other tissues want glucose, it will be dysphorated, right? It will go as glucose and will disappear in the bloodstream. Now, where does this event happen in dysphorization? Anybody remembers? Where? In the plasma reticulum, and it's a phosphatase, right? It's a phosphatase. Okay, so the liver does that. Also, if we have a lot of glucose, and we can store it with glycogen. We can make glycogen out of it and store it, and the liver will be one of the sites for storing glycogen. <coughs> ah, this is what? What is this? To ribose and NADP. <coughs> oh, this is PPP. This is glucose phosphate pathway. All right? Of course, ribose can be used, as we see, due to time metabolism. You know, we have to see And NADPH can be used for many things. Synthesis and detoxification. Right? Okay? Uh, cool. Of course, Lucas itself can go through glycolysis and go to pyruvate, acetylcholine. What happens to acetylcholine? One of the many phases we have that we know this semester. Electric acid cycle. Electric acid cycle can, of course, give us energy through electron transfer chain. Acetylcholine can also go through another route. What's the other route? It can go to cholesterol. This is the route that we did talk about. And what can we do with cholesterol? It can do many things. Many, many things. One of them is making hormones, one of them is making bile salts, right? To multiply fatty acids when we when we need to digestion. And of course we can build fatty acids through fatty acid synthesis. Right? Can we do that? Can we do that? As it like those I mean through man So a lot of stuff can happen with that. Well what else can we do with that? One more thing, something on this slide. We can build some sort of bodies. Ego bodies. We can do with this, right? Here. All right, so here, this is several weeks in one side. How about fatty acids? What do we do with fatty acids in the liver? Well, um, of course, they can go to the liver. They are transported, they can go to the liver. Liver can have some of the fatty acids, right? It can metabolize it. Uh, we can make uh, plasma lipoprotein. They're transported through plasma lipoprotein, right? You know, especially when we digest them first, they go through chylomicrons, right? And they can travel through the blood, they can be stored, and they post tissues, etc. All right? Also, if we leave them, they then leave the adipose tissues and they travel through albumin as, as separate fatty acids. All right? Of course, fatty acids through brain oxidation will give us what? Acetylcholine. Acetylcholine can go through the that will give us energy. Okay? So again, we go back, of course, to the stress. What else can we do then? Of course, we can do cholesterol and we can do this one. Okay? So there's a lot of interaction, a lot of uh, uh, cross uh, or, or stuff in common between both of them. Okay. This is, by the way, the uh, fat cells, adipose tissues, and we can see how it has 
So now, let's consider our model, and that is over nutrition. Okay? Which, as my mom called it, feels like a pig. And she's talking about me. So I can talk about myself in this case. So what happens here? We have a lot of fatty acids in the blood. Let's start thinking of this metabolically. Okay, I need to think about this metabolically. Fatty acids, okay? Now, Atkins diet is very good if we do exercise and all that kind of stuff. But now we're eating and we're not exercising. And we have a lot of energy in our body. And so they will be stored in our different species. But now we are in that phase of overnutrition. We're going to have a lot of fat. What's going to happen to that lot of fat? All right? They will, actually, now that we are beyond the capacity that we have, they will go into the blood. Okay? There is no place to put them in. What to do with them? Triglycerols, fatty acids, so I mean, they will flood the blood. Who's going to have to take them? Somebody has to take them. They can stay in the blood, but eventually somebody has to take them. The liver will take them. The liver, as always, is our really uh, elaborate chemical factory that will try to process some of this, try to, to uh, avoid, avoid any problem that happens. All right? So the liver will take them, the muscles will take them too, okay? That actually will lose that. And to lose the tone of the muscle that wrote to it will turn it on a bit and then try to do something with it. Alright? So the thing is, you listen, this is a fatty liver. It's gonna happen, eventually the liver will become enlarged and we have something called fatty liver, which is that which is something similar to actually what's gonna happen next metabolic syndrome. Our fat has a lot of fat, our our liver has a lot of fat, mentioned the whole muscles. Because we are, we run out of space, we no longer have and equals tissues to store them. Okay. So now, let's look molecularly, chemically, what's going to happen? This is metabolic syndrome. Beta oxidation does this normally, from any damage. Then we'll break it into C type of examine, which will enter into the citric acid cycle. Citric acid cycle will give us energy. We don't need energy, we just have a lot of energy. Alright? So, what happens in beta oxidation? In order to do beta oxidation, first of all, even though we don't need energy, we need to internalize the fatty acid molecules into what? Into the mitochondria, because that's where beta oxidation takes place. Right? Well, that system is going to be overwhelmed because the citric acid cycle cannot run faster than that threshold that it has. So now, the citric acid cycle, the revolving door, is no longer going as fast as there's fat there. So, actually, that Cytoplasm will be flooded with the fatty acids, the extra fatty acids. I'm talking about the liver in this case and the muscles and so on. So we have a lot of fat and the cytoplasm. Wow. A lot of fat, fatty acids, and of course we have glycerol because we broke them from the adipose tissue. So what's going to happen? Eventually we're going to have to reincorporate into the triglycerides just because it's a chemical balance. Pure chemistry. So all of a sudden, while we had a lot of fatty acids and glycerols, under normal, normal circumstances, they will go through beta oxidation and the soil will go to gluconeogenesis or provide energy, depending on what the situation is. Now they find themselves together again. We have to reincorporate them to glycerides, triglycerides. Triglycerides, diglycerides. Diglycerides, one of the things. So what's going to happen? Tri and diglycerides. Where we see this? You see a cylinder messenger in one of the 70 atmospheres, right? So all of a sudden, we have a secondary messenger because of the incorporation of the extra fatty acids into visceral, but we don't have any hormone that triggered this. Yet we have somewhere in the middle a secondary messenger that is uncalled for that's going around activating what? Protein kinase. So all the stuff that happens before that is even non-existent. Nobody triggered the message. There's no hormone. We don't need energy. So it should really shut down. But because of that overwhelming amount of fatty acids and glycerols in the cytoplasm that we have no place to store them, they got reincorporated and they made us diacylglycerol, a secondary messenger of this particular system. That will inadvertently bind to protein kinase C. Protein kinase C will be activated. Right? What happens when it gets activated? It will phosphorylate proteins. It's on proteins, but Protein kinases, we need to know, these are general proteins. They will actually, if, if they run out of things to phosphorylate and they're still active, they will phosphorylate any protein. Right? 
with, with much less efficiency, but they were just for identical. Okay? But we have really a rogue signal that has no origin. All right, so now that protein kinase is active and equatorial in left and right with absolutely no control. One of the things eventually that we will get this protein. This protein. That's part of the insulin signal system. Remember that? Let's talk about this. IRS. Now, IRS, in order to do this job, it has to be phosphorylated at each amino acid. Pyrocene. But protein kinase phosphorylates what? Serino 3. Different amino acids of the IRS are phosphorylated. Does that make it a good message at that point? Would it, would it give the message off? No, because it's phosphorylated in the wrong place. All of those here will not even see that message. Okay? Because it's phosphorylated in the wrong place. As matter as phosphorylated before even insulin got here. So when insulin comes, well, this is phosphorylated in the theory now. Okay? So we get another message. We get another message, and that's a very horrible thing to do. Because that insulin all of a sudden has no authority. This is called insulin resistance. But this is part of the insulin resistance. One part of the insulin resistance, where you have actually the internal message is sabotaged by phosphorylating the wrong amino acid because of the wrong message here. So insulin will come, will do nothing. Now what does insulin do? Insulin, which you are many uh, glucose transporters, and actually the pancreas itself will take some of that glucose, because now we have a lot of glucose in the body, right? And so glucose will be internalized by the, uh, the uh, pancreas, by the beta cells, and one, once that, the, the, this is because they have a lot of sugar. So once the pancreas has a lot of sugar that it doesn't have before, it will actually metabolize it, just like everybody else, into, into a pancreas and, and will give us energy, and will make ATP. That usually, under normal circumstances, that extra ATP will open different channels and will stimulate the beta cells to produce insulin. So insulin will be produced and will be secreted out of that pancreas and will go to the bloodstream and will go and say, hey, we have a lot of glucose, let's get the brute force to get the glucose away from that blood. Let's get it inside, okay, to store it. But remember what happened is that insulin is no longer giving the message. So no matter how many times it binds to those receptors, there will be no glucose transport, would it? It's still, there is a resistance to insulin. So the pancreas doesn't think that the insulin is working, so it will produce more insulin. And will produce more insulin. And producing insulin means making protein. Remember that insulin is a protein. A lot of translation, a lot of transcription, a lot of cell cellular resources to make. And yet, still the insulin, the uh, pancreas transporter is getting more glucose, as if nothing is happening. Usually, it will stop once there is no glucose coming inside, but again, there is resistance to insulin. So, it will keep doing what it's doing until finally it undergoes apoptosis. Apoptosis. Here's the word, apoptosis. That means committing suicide in cellular uh, terms. The beta cells will basically undergo apoptosis and they will die. And hence there will be no more insulin. What does that mean? Does that mean you change from metabolic syndrome to type 2 diabetes? Okay, so that can happen after metabolic syndrome. After, after you go through uh, extreme obesity, that's the next thing that will happen. That means you can't even produce insulin at one point after that. Okay, why? Because cells, the beta cells in the pancreas got killed, all right? So now it doesn't matter whether the message doesn't get there or whether it gets there, because you don't even have insulin production anymore. So that causes that to bad ones. Now usually, with, with lifestyle changes, you can actually take insulin and then insulin eventually will become, you will no longer have resistance to insulin. So you can reverse this. You still have a chance to reverse this. So from metabolic syndrome to type 2 diabetes, these are the metabolic pathways that got screwed up. Okay? And this is why, because fatty acids have overwhelmingly accumulated in the body. And all of a sudden we have a lot of glucose as well. 
So all of a sudden we have no communication with the outside world, which in this case means the blood stream, and hence everybody is doing uh, you know, a bad job because the messengers, the messages are not going through. Any questions? Did you get this? You got the sequential events? Very important that we need to Okay, so how many pathways we talked about so far? For review. Beta oxidation? Right? Good beta oxidation. Fatty acid synthesis, including the entryization of fatty acid in mitochondria. Of course, glycolysis. And here, who does glycolysis? The, the pancreas. Why does the pancreas do glycolysis? Pancreas is what it doesn't see much of glucose, but when it sees it, and it sees a lot of it, and it produces a lot of ATP, it will be forced. ATP in this case is a signal to make more insulin. If the insulin doesn't do its job and clear the glucose from the blood, then the pancreas will see more of that glucose and it will think that animals we still have to produce more insulin. Okay? So that will cause the whole All right. So, excess caloric intake, adipose tissues are overwhelmed, excess triglycerides, a lot of fatty acids, and of course, all those organs and, and systems are involved in this. Uh, yeah. Glucose will never clear here, the liver becomes fat liver, and eventually, of course, you end up having no, uh, no problems. And of course, the muscles are st uh, storing a lot of that fat as well. And the pancreas eventually shot itself dead because it found out that its insulin is not doing anything. I will pick it up for you, but I cannot bend it that far. <laughs> All right, because I have excess fat. <laughs> All right, any questions? All right. All right. Lazarus, those are the proteins. You've seen some of them, right? Those are cal this can be cal microns, can be lots of This is what we're going to be talking about. Those type proteins, remember, fatty acids are not dissolved. This is what we detect when we do our blood test. You know, what makes my doctor very angry at me is because it sees a lot of those stuff. Because they are basically bags of fat. Now, depending on what percentage of what kind of fat is there, we would have different classification of those little proteins. Most of us know problem with this. LDL, VLDL, HDL, chylomicrons, all that kind of And so basically, as you can see, it's a lot of fat, cholesterol, phospholipids, of course, <laughs> and, and, and triglycerides, and etc. All right? So those things, of course, eventually we have to spill back into that bloodstream, right? Because, because we have again fat. And so those are the different little proteins that some of those blood panel tests uh, take care of. And if you can see it, you should be able to see it clear, clear on, your, on your slides. We have chylomicron, this is the first one. This is the one that we form when we need fat to transport it to the adipose tissues. You can see here the percentages of the different fats. All right, I'm going to have to get closer so I can see it myself. All right, so the blue here is basically the triglycerides and cholesterol esters. And then the green is phospholipids, the red is cholesterol. And of course, this last thing here with proteins. So you can see as you go through this, you can see there's different percentages. That's why we have something called good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. And that depends on what kind of cholesterol and what's the percentage of the cholesterol compared to the rest of the components. And so high density level proteins, uh, high density because they have more proteins, and that's bad as well. So this is good. This is good. Those, if they have a lot of them, not good. Not good. We want to reduce those as much as and that's why we have those bad cholesterol and good cholesterol. We want to increase this as much as we want to reduce the triglycerides in the blood, hence reducing the possibility of having the, uh, the metabolic syndrome and, and God forbid later the type 2 values. Okay, we'll meet tomorrow to talk about the other tragedies. Tragedies, brother. Thank you. And uh, don't forget the quiz today. Regular quiz. I sent you that email this morning about coming to your office today. Yes. Which one? Are, which office are you going to be in? The uh, annex. Okay, at twelve thirty. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry. I thought I responded, but that, that, that. you just forgot to say which room. I just oh, wanted okay. to double check. Yes, it's the okay. annex. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.